Kelly Taylor Ryan and this is Mainly Unspoken. Today our show is about the education, the public educational system and our guest is Charlotte Isaby. She's a former U.S. Uh, senior former um, advisor for the Department of Education and she wrote a book called The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. Welcome Charlotte. Thank you very so much. So did I get that right? You were a former senior well, advisor. Well, senior policy advisor and it's the U.S. U.S. Department of Education, the US Department under of Education. President Reagan. Okay, glad to get that straightened right. out. The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. Why did you write this book? I started researching education in the early 70s after having returned from uh, Europe. Uh, overseas, actually, I had been in the Foreign Service for at least 18, uh, 18 years. Some of that was spent uh, after I got married and living in Belgium with my husband. but. I'd lived abroad for pretty much 18 years. And I came back to the United States and put my children in the public school in Camden, Maine. And I was absolutely shocked to see what was happening. And I don't think I was alone. That Good public school teachers, or older teachers, were also very shocked at the things that they were being required to do. And I kept asking questions such as, uh, well, one, one very interesting little exercise that was in the New Social Studies textbook which was called, school, what was it called, World of Mankind, published by Follett, was for the teacher to take the little tots in first grade through town, whatever town it is in the United States, wherever, and um, ask them to identify the houses in town, the big houses and the little houses. And uh, what do you think they eat in the big house? What do they eat in the little house? And I thought, what and is this? The point being, uh, what? This is, you know, to create the class system, class warfare really. And I knew that because I'd lived in socialist countries, so I thought, what is going on here? So I went to the school board meeting, not realizing that I was going to be, what a, uh, I really, uh, I caused quite an uproar, and I, they, they hauled me up the flagpole as a censor, because I said, what, is, what does this have to do with education? I don't really understand. And I realized then that things had changed. And so then I began to check on other things other than social studies, and I saw that they were not, they were planning on easing out the grammar. They were planning on getting rid of A, B, C, D, all these things that were quite traditional, and it worked very well. You know, the audience has to understand that the United States had the finest education system in the world until probably 1960. And so uh, all of a sudden, and I went out of the country in 19, when did I leave? Oh, 1953. And so I, I left when we had this great system of education. And because so, they were sticking with the basics. Oh, yes. They were yes. teaching people how to read, how to write, That's right. how to do research. Yes. And then you come back, and all of a sudden, instead of focusing on the oh, basics, yes. they're taking kids down the street and saying, yes. well, what do the people in this big yes. house eat? What are the people in this small That's right. And the point but what was the point that they would tell the citizens, not, not class oh, warfare? Well, you're, that's a very good point you're making. It is, uh, they would say, well, this is a world of mankind. You know, the children have got to understand that there are all different groups of types of income, people who are poor, people in other countries. And later on, they were even having the children eating rice for breakfast. And a lot of, you know, the audience saw this. They, they'd have the children role playing. Uh, starving children in uh, Ethiopia or wherever. This, this is to change their values. The whole purpose of this kind of education, which really is uh, socialization, it's, uh, I call it so socialism education, really, redistribution of wealth, et cetera, uh, is to change our children through the schools uh, so that they will uh, be very comfortable living in a socialist world management system. And very clear, the uh, teacher's manual for this particular social studies textbook was said, it, I mean, I don't know that they do that, it, that, they're that clear about it anymore. It said it was based on a humanistic curriculum, and they defined that. And they said basically it was children had to be educated, to be tolerant of all religions, all lifestyles, 
Uh, they should understand other uh, forms of government, basically. But that's not a bad thing. No, it sounds good, it doesn't sounds it? It sounds very good. Yes, but the point was that they were not emphasizing the United States Constitution. They were not emphasizing rights, absolute moral values at all, right and wrong, which had been emphasized in all curriculum ever since this country was founded. And even under the public school system, you know, we had the Ten Commandments uh, hanging in the classroom. No more of that, because you, you've got to be tolerant of everybody's viewpoint and everybody means the whole world so the education from so it's taking our culture away from yeah us. absolutely taking your culture away so I uh, I became very concerned and I wrote letters to the paper and I even ran, ran for school board I finally got elected after three tries and I did manage to get uh, a lot of the very bad programs out the values clarification survival games they were putting them in where the children decide who's going to be allowed to live and who's going to die, who's going to be in the lifeboat, who's going to be uh, allowed in the bomb shelter. Or, uh, they'd be given a list, a priest, a some pregnant people, woman. Some people would say that's critical thinking, teaching yeah, them how that's, to think. Well, you, you're correct. And critical thinking, you see, was the label that was given to the values clarification after the tremendous controversy over values clarification. And it's the same thing. In fact, Lenin coined the word critical thinking. Is that right? Yes, and it's non-absolutist thinking that evolves, and it's the dialectic where you have uh, the thesis and the antithesis. For instance, uh, it's wrong to steal. That's the thesis. The antithesis is it's okay. And so uh, you finally, you come to the synthesis is sometimes it's okay. And you can do this with anything, stealing, murder, abortion, uh, whatever. And, so there's uh, no right or wrong. You end up with a synthesis <laughs> where sometimes it's okay. And then you just keep moving, you know, t towards the non-absolutist viewpoint, and you sort of end up where it's okay all the time. Abortion is a very good good issue to, okay. to take on that score. I mean, it, we've finally gotten to the point where it's, it's just okay, huh? But uh, there used to be a time when sometimes it's okay. Uh, so anyway, the, the textbook was very clear that this, the, the, the goal of this particular social studies program was to, at a very early age, start to change the children's uh, attitudes and values. Really brainwashing. This is what it is. And I recognized that because I had lived in, in socialist countries, traveled in communist countries. And so this retired teacher came to me. Really nice woman. I'll never. She was so important in my life and in everybody's life, for that matter. I mean, the book probably never would have happened if it hadn't been for this retired teacher. And she said, "Charlotte, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I want you to go for some in-service training down east in Searsport, Maine." And she said, "I'm going to pay." And I said, "Well." Oh, all right. She gave me a hundred-dollar bill. That's a lot back in 1973. Mm -hmm. And I went. And all these people seem very normal, nice teachers, you know, look, look like your best friend, your neighbor. And the guy who was running it, the facilitator, had this great big textbook that we could all, we all got that free, it came part of the package, and it was called Innovations in Education, A Change Agent's Guide. A Change, change Agent. Agent's Guide. Okay. And who was putting this on again? Uh, this was uh, the... Well, it was a group in Maine. I can't remember the name of the education group it was, but they sponsored it. I don't know that it was even the Department of Education. But the, the textbook was published and paid for by the United States Department of Education. Mm -hmm. And it, it was put together by a professor, Ronald Havelock, at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And basically what we were taught was that we were being taught to be change agents. Uh, how to go into a community as a teacher or even some parents are selected, you know, who are all gung-ho for this new stuff. Well, it's not new anymore. They were putting it in in the early 70s. Much of it was funded under Linda Johnson's Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which uh, was passed in 1965, uh, where they changed education from academics, basically, to behavior modification, which is necessary for uh, the planned economy. For school to work, so that's just an aside. So we'll go into that later. That's how you change people. Absolutely, right. and, and control them. And control them. And so um, he taught us how to identify. Say they they want to put in a sex education program or a death education program or whatever, and they know that the community isn't ready for that. And so 
we were taught how to identify the resistors, the and potential resistors. The people that would disagree. Oh yeah, like me. I, I mean, it was extraordinary to be tra trained to identify myself mm -hmm. because I was a big resistor. But you and, didn't let them know that. Oh, no, they didn't know. They thought I was one of them. And so I, I just was, you know, my hair, my scalp tingled. I thought, what is going on? You know, this is what they do in, in they, this Nazi Germany. They do this in communist countries or, or fascist countries. They identify the resistors. And they keep a records on them, and they, they isolate them, and sometimes they end up putting them you know where. And uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn was a resistor. He spent eight years in the gulag. And I thought, whoa. And the resistors were these great people, and I only know Maine for that matter, and they were terrific at the time. And uh, they were taking a stand against these programs. And many of them were saying, even if they didn't know what they were, saying, look, wait a minute, we don't have enough time in the school day for reading, writing, arithmetic, history, et cetera. What are you doing bringing in all of these programs? sex ed, drug ed, suicide ed, uh, critical thinking ed, values clarification, all these things that which interestingly enough, I'm, I just while we're talking about this, I have to show you this monstrous book. Uh, all of these programs that had nothing to do with education. And I want your, your is it audience, down? is it upside down? Oh, pace setter, okay, yes. Pace setters in innovation. Now this is a, what do you think, about three inch thick? Yes. Yeah, uh huh. This was published in 1968, uh, and it's a result of the passage of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which I mentioned, be brainwashing, behavior modification. All, these are all programs in here to brainwash our children. Now, what are, what are the teachers saying about this? Or are they being brainwashed Oh, too? the poor teachers at the time, uh, if they didn't like it, they, you know, there was a way to get rid of them. What they did, though, rather than uh, automatically, because you, if they had tenure, you can't get rid of them, they would put them through the training, all this in-service training the poor teachers had to go through. But this is an extraordinary book. I mean, it's just, you just take a look at, look at these programs. They're all throughout here. Well, Value change. They even had school buses that had, they were playing tapes. Subliminal tapes? So, yeah. You're for, kidding. Wait, no, they, no, they were just tapes that were, uh, to help to change the children's values. I, I never heard any of them, but the, the program is in here. And the mastery learning programs were in here, master teachers programs, all the programs going in now, global ed individualized education programs, et cetera. So going back so to- So it's taking the power away from the parents. Oh yeah, ab absolutely. But the parents don't even know that's what's happening. No, no, and they trust, they're so trusting. So. Anyway, uh, I went through that, and then we were also taught how to identify uh, the important people in the community, really good people who want to help and, have, and volunteer to be on task forces to implement these things, whether they're Chamber of Commerce, the Rotary, Garden Club, and, and uh, these poor people have been used. We were trained how to identify them, go to them, get them to... Uh, take a position in the community because they were highly thought of, people would listen to them. And what was the mission? What did they tell you was the mission of being a change agent? Oh, to bring about change, that the, everything, the world, if I heard that, my, my superintendent in Camden was a change agent himself, and uh, I got along pretty well with him because he knew I knew. Right. In fact, he said to me after I went through the training, he said, why did you go to that training? He said, I give that training too, I, you could have taken it from me, and I, I said to him, Tom, I didn't have to take it from you. All I have to do is sit opposite you at a school board meeting. Yeah. Because I know, I know how you all operate. And it is so sad that the, the American, that the education establishment at the highest levels, I'm not talking about teachers, uh, has decided that they have to manipulate the people in order to get but the But why? Why would a superintendent in Maine, a very small community, want to change his community. What is he getting out oh, of Oh, well, no, he's really not getting anything, but he's a professional change agent. And I might point out that uh, Maine is very important for this. Uh, Maine has, has had the uh, National Training Laboratories in Bethel, Maine, ever since the 50s. And people come from all over the world to go through uh, training. They could be doctors, lawyers, ministers, teachers. They go there for training to become a change agent. 
here in Maine. Yes, and this is in Bethel, Maine, and we ski in Bethel, Maine, and, and uh, you know, we ski in Sun at Sunday River. And uh, I've been over there in the summer, but they're usually closed whenever I go. But it's an old estate that was converted. And the people involved in this were deeply involved in intelligence in the beginning in, with the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, prior to the, the intel, uh, Central Intelligence Agency. And they understand brainwashing. And uh, so they're, who's in charge of all this? You're telling me if I'm hearing this correctly. Yes, the National Education Association, uh -huh. the United States Department of Education. Uh, you have to remember that the U.S. Department of Ed, this will come as a surprise to many people, uh, does fund the National Education Association for various purposes. Uh, not all the time, but it is funded by the National Education, uh, by the department. You know, so this has been going on for a long, long time. And uh, so anyway, I got in there, and when I saw that, I just, as an American, and I, I just really was sort of an apple mom and apple pie, red, white, and blue, you know, Memorial Day parades. I was brought up that way by my family. My father was a lawyer. My mother volunteered for everything. And, and I just was appalled. I've never, ever gotten over it. I got on the white horse in 19... 75 and I've never that poor horse I've never gotten off that white horse and I will not until they stop this until they stop what is actually brainwashing and okay, parents, you have to go back a little bit yep. okay because you're losing me here yep, a little okay. bit okay you're saying they're brainwashing okay you're saying yep. these people that are experts in brainwashing is using the Department of Education to brainwash yep. our children yes. What are they after? Why are they doing it? Well, you, if you want to move a country from a, a free individualistic economy. Which we have. Yes, or had. Or had, okay. To a planned economy, uh, you have to do it through the schools. You have to dumb down and brainwash, change the attitudes and values. You have to completely, uh, social engineering has to go on constantly and many teachers know what I'm talking about and I will people are going to say well when did this start and who 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 on earth ever did this mm -hmm. whoever why would a plan like that be allowed to be carried out that's right well then you have to go back to 1934 which I will do and we have to go to the three pronged fork okay so I do think that the watershed year, although you can go back to the early part of the century when the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie Corporation were deeply involved in education, and that it was decided then that Carnegie would deal with the international part and Rockefeller domestic. And, but then we moved on to 1934, and this was after World War I, and uh, there were these the educators, were many of them going back and forth to uh, Russia, very admiring of the new system in Russia, the communistic system. And they wanted to put it in here, in the United States. And so the Carnegie Corporation that had always been involved in, you know, trying to get us into world government after, after uh, the League of Nations and all in 1917, mm -hmm. uh, they still had this goal. And of course, world government will be communism. I mean, it's really international socialism. That's what Lenin called it. So they've always wanted this. And, and the Department interestingly of Education enough, today is going along with yes, that? Yes, absolutely, yes. And so uh, in 1934, the Carnegie Corporation produced, it, it took four years, they commissioned the American Historical Association to put together uh, a study of the social, social studies. And they came up with uh, lots of volumes, but I have one little volume, Conclusions and Recommendations for the Social Studies. And basic that little one is an original book. I wish I'd brought it with me too bad, but I don't even dare let it out of the house, it's so important. It called for changing the United States through the schools from a free individualistic economy to a, a socialist, collectivized, planned economy in the new world order. It says that in the book? Yes. And that book was written when? In 1934. By who? It was the Carnegie Corporation paid for it, uh, to have the, the American Historical Association put it together. And, uh, and can people get that book in the library? Uh, no. No? No? <laughs> no, but, uh, no, they can't. Uh, but um, I have quotes in my book, you know, from it. But uh, from that time on, Carnegie Corporation consistently, without any, uh, any um, hesitation whatsoever, didn't run, in, run into any obstruction, uh, poured its money, its tax-exempt money, which we make possible for them to have, 
uh, into changing American education. Uh, they funded the, uh, well, let's go on to the 1945, uh, the, the deeply involved, Alger Hiss was deeply involved with the Carnegie Corporation. He was a uh, accused uh, Soviet agent. They didn't get him on it, but he really, they got him on libel. But most people do think that Alger Hiss was a Soviet agent. Uh, he was Carnegie. And uh, they were very instrumental in getting the Elementary and Secondary Education Act passed, which, as I said before, changed education from knowledge, content based, academic to performance-based behavior. Uh, and from that time on, because that was necessary for what we're looking at now with school to work, school to work agenda is the planned economy is performance-based. So they're, they're training workers. They're training not thinkers, worker not based. leaders. Exactly. So uh, Carnegie, uh, after that study, then we went to the world, we, we went into the United Nations, which of course was essential, and then we at that time, you had a general, a, a Brock Chisholm, a Canadian general psychiatrist, mm -hmm. who was a very close friend of Alger Hiss's. And he gave a speech in 1945 to the World Health Organization, which basically recommended getting rid of the conscience. Wow. Yes. And he said, we would do it through the schools. We would retrain the teachers to be little psychiatrists. And uh, what happened was that the average American educator at that time was not about in 1945 to even listen to something like that. Right. And so nothing happened until the watershed year again, another watershed year, 1965, when, when the Elementary and Secondary Education Act passed and we moved then from academics to behavior change. And the Behavior Science Teacher Education Program was funded. But how did Congress allow that to happen? Well, you'll see in the book, John Ashbrook, who died, unfortunately, uh, Congressman Ashbrook, who I dedicated the book to, he spelled it all out. He told the whole Congress exactly what it was. He said it is an international system they're looking at. They're going to change the behavior of the children. They're going to change the teachers' training. They're going to do everything. He told them everything. And they didn't believe him? No. They, they just let, well, you know what goes on. Yes, I it's do. Going, still going on, right? So anyway... Um, they passed that in, in 1965. The teachers were, were retrained. Uh, all of these horrible programs, right? Mm -hmm. By 1968, the money had gone into all of these programs to get rid of the conscience, basically. Drug ed, all these programs, parents, really, when you see education hanging on the end of a, like, a drug education, sex education, uh, critical thinking education, red flag, you don't have reading education, writing education, math education, or we didn't used to. When you see education hanging on the end of something, except for driver's ed, which I think is probably pretty neutral, uh, that means watch it. Because the, the, those programs, I've never seen one of those programs that uh, was based on absolutes, right and wrong. But the parents of the children today have gone through that program. So yes. they've already been brainwashed. So they're not going to believe well, me. Well, yes, they do believe me. Many okay. of them call, and when I do radio interviews, they'll mm -hmm. call in and say, I went through all of that. I know exactly what you're talking about. And of course, the teachers know. And many teachers do not like that, did not ever want to do it. Behind closed doors, they did their own thing. Now they're not going to be able to get away with it because they're going to be required due to the, the standards that are being set and the accountability, the whole what's going on in Washington now with the uh, reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act is nothing but brainwashing. And people, you hear standards and accountability and flexibility, all of this. Basically, the goal has nothing to do with academics. It has to do with training little, as you said, little busy little workers, little worker bees, mm -hmm. uh, to have the right attitudes and values towards uh, internationalism, giving up our sovereignty, uh, the needs of the group versus the individual. You know, they, they have all the group grades now and uh, Did they cooperative have a start learning. Talking about being a change agent, how to stop teaching people about basic civics what the Constitution says, limitation of government. I mean, did, did they get into no, that? No, I don't recall that, but I do know that I've seen uh, in, in uh, I, I, I attend a lot of in-service things too, you know, 
So uh, I have seen in, and, and heard, you know, how are we going to get away from, and that's in the book. Actually, there's a very interesting article in the New York Times in the early 70s about getting rid of the teaching of American history. You're kidding. Oh, no, not early 70s. New York Times article in the book, and it says that, uh, and, oh, yeah, wow. yes, and we're not going to talk about George Washington anymore. We're going to focus on the world because you have to get these world-minded students or else they're going to rebel. If you, if you want to put the, the Americans under a global management system or whatever it is, be very careful you don't teach them the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, don't let them have any history because they are going to object when, when this system is taken away from them. But they won't now. You could take the Constitution away from the American people right now and they wouldn't care because they don't even know what it is. They don't know well, it they is. Well, they don't know what it, it is. It protects them, that protects their rights. Uh, the reading problem. Uh, if you're so dumbed down, if you can't read, I've always said you can't defend yourself. That's right. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't do anything. I mean, you are really uh, at a tremendous loss. You are totally handicapped, worse than losing both legs if you can't read. They can take you right through the schools, uh, 12 years without reading, just total brainwashing through visual, a lot of visual aids now with technology. So they're trying to make people weaker readers? Oh, of course. Yes, that's why they had the whole language for so long. Which is what I always, I always thought was very dumb. <laughs> Yeah, it is pretty dumb. Uh, I think that some of the some teachers, a really good teacher with whole language and an understanding of, of uh, the traditional phonics. I don't mean direct instruction, which mm. is Skinner, the Skinner phonics, but a good teacher who who understood phonics, well, could could use a whole language program quite well because I there are some things about whole language I like, you know, where your the children are really immersed in a, in a lot of good literature. Sometimes it's not so good, and so it depends on the teacher. But anyway, uh, the, the, the dumbing down was absolutely deliberate, and you don't even have to go through all of the documents that I have in my book, but just ask yourself, why is it that last week the Senate voted in the House on the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and it comes to something like, I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I mean, it's 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 it's... I think it's a hundred billion. <laughs> it's a hundred billion dollars a year, oh, and we have children who can't. We're we're at the bottom of the list internationally, academically, and we're spending a hundred billion. We will be because it's reauthorized for seven years. It's not quite that. It's I have to be fair, but with the interest that's going to be paid on the debt, yes, it will be one hundred billion dollars a year, and you have homeschoolers. And private schools that are doing it on $2,000 a year per pupil? So we don't need to spend all that money. We don't. But you see, the brainwashing is horribly expensive. And when we think that the, a program has failed, I mean, I saw all these programs in the U.S. Department of Education. Mm -hmm. right? I, I just, I was, in fact, I was relieved of my duties for leaking a very important one. But when we think a program has failed, you and I, to the top educators, not the teachers, the top educators, it's successful because that's what they want. And they take their orders not just from the U.S. Department of Ed. I know this because I was there. I know where we got our orders from. Where? The U.N. We get it from the U.N.? Yes. And this is an international plan. And I just took something off my email today out of England. England is putting in the exact workforce training, the exact standards, the exact teach to the test, which a good, no good teacher wants, teaching to the test. They're going to fire the teachers who won't teach to the test. I mean, and they're going to fire the teachers who don't get the results. What's interesting is if you go back to the late 1800s in England, in my book, they had a, a form of outcome-based education. And, and this is was, what it's called. Yeah, well, that's outcome-based education because you're teaching to the narrow curriculum, just really workforce training skills will be, or attitudes, certain attitudes, get so along, get along in a group. one area, and they won't know what exactly. else is going on. And that we really ought to discuss, because people think school to work is probably like vocational education. But it's not. No, and it's not, and it's you don't start vocational education in kindergarten. <laughs> And uh, school to work is being started in kindergarten, where they're focusing on work and jobs, et cetera, and taking children to nursing homes, this, that, and all. And by fourth grade in some states, they're, uh, identif they're psychologically profiling the child to find out, can you imagine in fourth grade, mm. 
what he would be good at, do, what he should do in the future. And what they will start doing is uh, they will apply the curriculum. It's called applied learning. And you might think as a mother or, or father that your child is taking a regular math program for mm -hmm. first grade or second grade. Let's say fourth grade. And uh, you better find out because your child your child's future may have already been identified. So are you suggesting everyone take their kids out of public school and homeschool them? Well, yeah, well, if, if possible, that certainly is a good idea. But a lot of parents, including myself, probably wouldn't. I, would, I don't think I would have been very good at homeschooling. But what I'm suggesting is that parents uh, take their children out of the public school system, but there's a caveat there. Uh, they should find a good private school if they can. And homeschooling, of course, is good. But make sure that the private school that you select, whether it could be a Christian school or an independent, non-sectarian -sectar school, uh, is not worse than the public school. I have found out from many parents who've done this that they want to put the children back in the public school. Now, they may have had a pretty good public school. At this point, there are some public schools that are still pretty good, but they won't be for long because they are Can going to get rid them? of it. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to go into ones in Maine because um, I, I really, uh, as I told you, um, I've got a lot of documents on Maine, but I, I decided that it, uh, my my uh, efforts could be better spent on a national basis uh, rather than getting deeply involved in Maine because I would have become much too close to the problem and become very upset. Maine is leading the pack with the restructuring. That's all that I can say. And, uh, and Jock they've been doing that since when? Oh, yeah. Well, they've been doing it since the mid-20s when uh, this Augustus Thomas was, uh, was named superintendent of schools in Maine, and he was a big internationalist. And he gave a speech to the National Education Association in regard to the need for using the schools to bring about world government. So he was... He Back was, in the 1800s, he no, said No, this was in 1922. 1922, I think. That. And uh, so he was the head of the Carnegie Corporation, but he was part of that pack. It was a very, these gentlemen, and I really, they were gentlemen at that time, and I think that, well-meaning. Uh, I really believe after World War I, they all sort of fought, fell for this uh, idea that we never want to have another war again, and we're all going to have to get along, and we hear all this now, too. And uh, also that uh, the Soviet Union, when it was first created in 1917, I believe it was 1917 that he may have given that speech. Yeah, yeah, huh? Uh, they, they thought that this was a good idea. They had been convinced at the university, Ivy League universities mostly, that uh, the United States uh, was so wealthy and we should you know, have, be concerned for the poor. And we had a poor and rich in our country, the coal mines and the, all this was going on. And, and uh, so they were convinced that this was the way to go. And you know, I don't want to attribute any really evil motives to them at that time. Uh, however, with Carnegie has held on to these motives for just too long, uh, able to see uh, the brutality of communism and understanding that, but still very deeply involved in uh, pushing the agenda to the point where in 19, uh, in 19, well, 1958, Dwight Eisenhower, our president signed agreements with the Soviet Union in every area imaginable, including education. Carnegie was involved in that. And then in 1985, they kept renewing all of these agreements. 85, Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan, uh, and the Carnegie Corporation signed agreements with Gorbachev and, and with the Soviet Academy of Science to really basically merge the two systems. Oh, what a shock for people to hear that. Although they're, they're, right now they're heaving a great sigh of relief because they're saying, oh, but Charlotte, communism is dead. The Department of Education, is that constitutional? No, it is not constitutional. And there, and there is nowhere in the Constitution that it calls for a Department of Education. Uh, anything not mentioned, as you know, in the Constitution as uh, the role of the federal government is left to the states. So but when did the yep. Department of Education come into being? In 1978. 1978? Yes, under, under Carter, okay. under President Carter. He promised the NEA that if he could get their votes. And the interesting thing there was that the majority of teachers at the time did not want a U.S. Department of Education. And, and why is that? Oh, well, because 
they're smart. They know that this is going to control what they teach and how they teach. They don't want that. And uh, so, but anyway, it was created. And then Ronald Reagan, uh, who I just mentioned, signed the agreements with the Soviet Union. Those agreements are a whopper, I can tell you that. Curriculum ch exchanges, developing curriculum on critical thinking with the Soviet Union. Uh, all of this led to implementing the Soviet Polytech system, which is the school to work. And uh, people could say that's not possible. It is. There's a, there was a $4 million grant to a professor that's in my book uh, to research the Soviet Polytech system. And so what we're putting in is the failed Soviet Polytech system. And people are out there, and they're probably saying, and I, I, I really plead with my good friends in Maine, or in any state, please do not sell your children short and, and tell me that, oh, all I care about is that my child gets a job. Oh, wow. Please don't tell me that anymore because you should care about your child having uh, access, exposure to a liberal arts curriculum, which means history and math and science and art and music. And choosing the life he wants. And, yes, very good, what you just said. Choosing the life he wants. And I, I had a radio interview with uh, uh, in Minnesota recently, and I was talking about this. It was a very good, it was an old rock and roll station. I really interested in guys listening, and a lot of people wondered, you know, why, how I got on that. I don't know how I got on, but it was so successful. And this lady emailed me after I talked about this, and she said, uh, you have no idea. My son was with me in the car. He's 12, and I've had a terribly hard time with him. We homeschool him, and he wants to go back to public school, and he's been miserable and all, but he heard you talking about the school to work. Mm -hmm. And he said, just what you said, he said, Mom, I want to choose my future. And you know what he did? What? He went, even though Congress doesn't understand the dangers of school to work, this 12-year-old went to this big rally in Minneapolis where they're trying to kill the legislation which is implementing all this restructuring, I wish we had the same thing going in Maine to kill it here. Uh, he went to the, the um, hearing at the state, state house, and he had a big sign which said, I want to choose my future. And I think this is great because why is it that he at 12 understood what school to work is, but you can't get Governor McKernan when he was governor, you can't get Senator Mary Small to understand it, you can't get Jane Amaro, you can't get Governor King, you can't get any of the people involved in implementing this in Maine because they do not want to understand it. They have been given all of the documents and they and I think this is so sad. What about Olympia Snow and Susan Collins? No, I'm not going to do anything. And uh, all I can say is that when they voted Goals 2000 in and the school to work legislation in the 90s and the 80s, first of all, it was really Ronald Reagan started it. Then you had Lamar Alexander. These are all Republicans. Lamar, first of all, Ted Bell was the Secretary of Education. Then you had uh, uh, Lamar Alexander. And then you had, uh, and Bill Bennett. Oh, all Republicans. And you, all of this, and, and then President Bush, the former President Bush, in the congressional record in my book, calls for the apprenticeship system, calls for training the children for the workforce. Then his son, of course, and then you have Clinton, who all was in, involved in it too, all the governors involved. And uh, then you have uh, George Bush Jr. implementing it. His, his bill, the education bill that just is passing right now, is embraced by Senator Ted Kennedy. Now, if people don't understand here that we have a serious problem, the Republicans and the Democrats at the top are totally in bed together on this. And that's because they are both controlled by the internationalists. And the international agenda is this. And Strobe Talbot, who was the Undersecretary of State for Bill Clinton, uh, in 1992, he gave a very important, he, he, he had an interview with Time Magazine, I think, and he said, this is verbatim, Strobe Talbot, Rhodes Scholar, went to Oxford with Bill Clinton, very close to Clinton, ended up working for Madeleine Albright. He said, in the next century, which is right now, we're mm -hmm. sitting here, the United States will cease to exist in its present form. That's pretty sad. And we will owe our allegiance to a global government. Now, I want your audience out there to understand 
that this restructuring of education, which has been in the works for 100 years, as I've tried to point out, is just the culmination of the plan. It has been a deliberate dumbing down. They never could have done it to, to us if we've been well educated. To make it easier to control. Exactly. And to put us under. And we will go under if people don't wake up. And the only way that we're, I believe, the education system is, is the most important thing of all because that's where the way you, you educate your children, their attitudes, their values, their understanding of freedom, etc., is cultivated in the schools. And if they do not have that, they're going to allow the most magnificent system, political and economic system the world has ever known to die. And it's dying right now because Congress voted to change our form of government in the 90s when they voted in the school to work agenda and the goals 2000. They did because if you change an economic system to a planned economy, there's no freedom left. In fact, the Business Alliance is one of these big groups. I have a document here. I, it takes too long to go into all these documents, but from them. And you know what it says? This is for people in your audience who think you're off the hook. Oh, no, Grandma. You're not off the hook. Neither are you, Grandpa. Because it's kindergarten through age 80. That they're going to be brainwashing. Yes, and it is on this piece of paper, kindergarten through age 80. And that is why Andy Rooney, you know, who does 60 Minutes, a couple of weeks ago, he was floating this balloon about people who aren't going to retire as early as they used to. Isn't this wonderful? Folks, you can work a little longer because you're so much healthier. They're just getting us used to that. It we're serves. going to work until we die. Yeah, we're sure. And this is all documented. And this is, the, this is an international plan. They have in Hong Kong, so they've got it? OBE, they've got everything they've got in Maine. Was it a, uh, a plan then to get both families or both parents to have to work then? Oh, yes, and the Federal Reserve did that through, through creating, you know, inflation, deflation. And defla that's to weaken the family? They had to do that. They had to get the mom out so that they get the schools in. School into the, I showed you that. This is just extraordinary, this little document here. It, this is Maine, and it's so exciting, this one, that I said it. I had all my friends around the, Maine's always in the vanguard on all of this stuff, right? Sorry, that's where your tax money is going, folks out there, you know, into doing a lot of pilot studies for the rest of the country and world, probably. Actually, the common core of learning that Maine has, it says in one of their documents that it's been used in nine foreign countries. So anyway, this is called a reaffirmation of faith in Maine's public schools. And you're talking about getting rid of the family influence, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You have this, uh, this building. It looks like a Greek temple. It has one, two, three, four, five columns. And I'll show it to you all later, but I have to read this. Uh, one column is educational system, mm -hmm. families, religious institutions. Isn't this interesting for mm -hmm. the public schools to be concerned about religious so institutions? There's supposed to be a separation yeah. there. Community, business, and industry. There it is. And this is loaded. This document is loaded. And so, uh, so the business world wants to control us yes. by turning us into serfs. Oh, yes. And they want to get your children the minute they're born. And Lamar Alexander, Republican uh, Secretary of Education and Governor, he's the one who said, we want to go into the schools the minute the baby is born and follow the to child. To train them right. That's right. And to get to make sure they're healthy, that's the school-based clinics. That's where you have the, they're bringing in the medical services into the schools. They want healthy workers. That's right. Health, they, from the beginning, they don't want anything to go wrong, so that worker is going to be the perfect worker. They used to call it the, the so, new Soviet man in, in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's exactly what's happening. And the, the, your child, uh, it, his, your child is nothing but a human resource to but be used know, people, for the good of the state. People are going to say, that's not right. People are going to say, yeah. you know, I struggled. I want my child to have a better life. Yep. Um, they're going to get a good job. They're going to be able that's to right. provide for themselves. And I don't think people are going to see how you're seeing it. I, I well, agree with you. Well, uh, I don't think most people probably are see probably that. not, and that's very that's very important since there was a time when they could afford not to see it, right? But they can't afford. They can't that. afford not to see it any longer, and I think that something's happened. I've noticed, for instance, with my book that uh, the controlled left, mm -hmm. which is Ted Kennedy and all who take orders from the UN, and the controlled right, 
who which also is take orders from the UN. Yes, the Heritage Foundation and a lot of the controlled uh, conservative media uh, who refused to review my book, right? Uh, because I, I am not in favor of uh, federally funded or uh, school choice proposals because I know that will take over the private sector. We can go into that later. That's why they don't want to do a review of my book. But uh, you, you have those two groups that uh, are, are working very closely together, uh, but they don't make up for the bulk of America. And so they won't buy my book. I mean, there's certainly some very fine Republican conservatives who've bought the book, but they are not in the controlled group. And it's the same. There's some very good liberals who bought my book because liberals don't want this done to their children either. Mm -hmm. But in the middle, I have all these people I've never, I don't know where they're coming from. It's sort of a middle America that has been working hard, knowing something had to be wrong. I mean, how can you spend close to $100 billion a year and kids can't read? Mm. They keep saying this, what's going on? And so they are buying big time, and the book is selling like mad. We've gone into a third printing in 18 months. That's wonderful. Yeah, and uh, because they're documents. They, these people are saying... That's proof, evidence. That what they're saying is... I don't want to listen to people, the talking heads, right. on Sunday morning anymore. I don't care whether it's because conservative they're or what. what they're told. That's right. right. I want the facts. And this book has the documents. This, it has the facts. Verbatim. And they're all cited. And Going no, back 100 years. Nobody's safe. I mean, if the shoe fits, you wear it. I'm sure that uh, you know, the, the conservatives, the control conservatives, they didn't like it at all when they looked in the index. And they found that I had had to tell the truth. So everyone needs to buy this book and read it. They sure do, and especially educators, and uh, oh, I'd say especially everybody. I think uh, the most important people right now, because the only way we get out of this mess is to get rid of the United States Department of Education. Abolish it. Abolish the, it, totally. That sounds pretty radical. Bring all control back. Well, it really isn't. The, the radical thing is that we decided to create a Ministry of Education, which is what every single uh, socialist country in this world has. And that was the radical thing that we did. Uh, so what we do is bring, bring education back to the local level, bring our, all our money back to the local level, let our teachers determine what curriculum they feel is best for and our children. And let the family teach the values. And let the family teach the values and uh, bring our education system back to the status it has prior to the 1960s. It, it, truly, folks, it was the finest in the world. That doesn't mean that we had the, I mean, in Europe you have the elite, which is going to be, again, you see, this is going to be the elite. 10 or 20 percent will get the liberal arts, get that, because they're going to be the leaders in this wretched system. Uh, but below that, they always had the people that didn't get the education, whereas in our country, we had an education system where everybody supposedly, there were always gaps, that's mm -hmm. true, but uh, everybody was supposed to have at least exposure to ancient history. Interesting point. I'll just make this point for because I love to mention it. Rockland, Maine, in the early 70s, we're talking about liberal arts, mm -hmm. math, science, all these things. In Rockland, Maine, I got a hold of a breasted ancient history book, required, 1972, required for sophomores. That's one of the finest history books that's ever been written. He is probably the most uh, credentialed scholar in ancient history in the world. Now, you I mean since 1972, what has happened? The whole thing has collapsed. They don't want our children to be exposed to any of this. They don't want them to know history because if you don't know history, You'll repeat those mistakes, That's won't you? That's right, absolutely. Exactly. And they want to change their attitudes and values from those that the moms and dads have, have tried to instill in them so that there's no right, no wrong. Sometimes it's okay to stay. Well, they're, gonna say, they're gonna say, Charlotte, they're teaching history. What do you mean by oh, that? Oh no, they're teaching global, global studies. They're not teaching the main constitution. Certainly, the, I, I think they got rid of t teaching those things quite a long time ago. And uh, the old time teachers, thank heavens my boys in the early 70s, before our change agent really accomplished a great deal of bad, you know, uh, evil stuff, I think. Uh, but those teachers were there for my children. And it was interesting. They hadn't been through, uh, you know, the University of Maine Teachers College and all. They were normal school or something. They, they, they didn't have all these degrees, but they knew how to teach reading and writing. The, the, the children had to have the multiplication tables. They had to draw a map of the United States. They had to name all the capitals. Uh, they had to know how much rainfall in Florida. All this they had to do. 
So this was the early 70s. I was very lucky. My boys were lucky. When they got into middle school and high school, things started then. We started getting into the individual education plans, which sounds so good, but you have an IEP. They have them in China, too. Hmm? That's how they keep the record on the individual citizen. So they have the individual education plan for education. They start it that way. Now, now everything's going in. the individual education plan is just for the special ed It used to be, but not anymore. Oh, really? And uh, Kennebunkport was the first uh, school to experiment with this, and I got a hold of it after I got out of the department because it got an award from the U.S. Department of Ed. And I got a hold of the material, and it, it said in there that they were putting in the IEPs, individual education plans. Mm -hmm. So the children are no longer competing with other children. They're working at their own pace. This is the real dumbing down. But if it you've sounds ever heard of nice. that. It sounds so nice. And you know children though wanting to work at their own pace right. with no competition. Yeah. I, that's I, that I never would have gotten anywhere that way. But uh, at the time the special education teachers were teaching or training the regular academic teachers in Kennebunkport on how to do these plans. And it said right in the book, the, the uh, booklet, or the award on it, that uh, the, re no, it wasn't in that booklet, it was in another one I got a hold of, that the regular education teachers did not want to do this, and it was not their role to be guidance counselors mm. and to follow the child's uh, behavior and attitudes and all. and. They did not want to be. They didn't want to have any part of IEPs. But they had no choice. No, and the IEP is essential if you think in terms of the computer. You see the and and the IEP, because the computer can track everything that a child knows, thinks, does, whatever, and it also uses the Skinner method, which is the dog training method. It rewards immediately after you get the right answer, mm. and that is the mastery learning or the direct instruction. So this. Uh, this is what went in, and but my children luckily were not exposed to that. Uh, there were things changing in English at that time, but I'm, I'm very grateful that they did get the education that they got when they did, but this has all changed. And there isn't a school, I want to make it very clear because people will say, well, but they're not doing that in my district. Well. Maybe they're not, but they're going to have to be under the new legislation that is the last nail in the coffin is right now implementing federal, uh, legislation. federal legislation. You will have to. And actually, uh, Maine, Maine was one of the first to go for the, uh, for the school to work agenda. I think this is 19, early 90s. The career, what's the date on this? 95. Here's the career opportunities, 2000. State of Maine application for a statewide school to work opportunity system implementation grant. Uh, that is an unbelievable document. <laughs> I'm sure they wish they hadn't given it to me. But you see, that was 1992. Now, there are some states that they, they hadn't gotten their money until the year 2000. So Maine has always been way ahead. Uh, Governor McKernan. That's because so that guy Augustus. Uh, yeah, could could well be, and he was a good friend, probably of Andrew Carnegie's. Who knows? Because it was the same period of time, and then along came Maine's Common Core of Learning, which uh, you know, the, if you look through this thing, it has absolutely nothing to do with with academics. But you, we have to understand that uh, the semantic deception. I'd like to talk, talk about, about the three that. prongs. Yeah, uh, a good way to remember this: the pre three-pronged fork because I don't want your audience or anybody for that matter to feel like they they were asleep at the switch but I really don't think they I think even if you'd been awake at the switch uh, you would not have been able to uh, notice to uh, notice how this was done and I think it's a very diabolical manipulative way uh, they used the three-pronged fork and one the first prong is the Everybody knows about the frog in the cold water. Mm. I was you slowly turn up yes. the heat, and they don't, he doesn't notice yeah. he's being cooked. That's right. And that's what's been happening to us. That's right. We're just about cooked now. Okay. But we have we people like you, and we have wonderful, a lot of wonderful people out there who I think are waking up, and the book is helping a lot. But uh, so the, the gradualism, the frog was probably thrown in the cold water around 19... Uh, Ten, you know. Oh wow! So it was a very slow yeah, cook. Yeah, yes, yes, slow cook. But 1934 was the watershed year. That's when the water got pretty hot. All right, with Carnegie saying we're going to use the schools to change America from a free individualistic economy to a socialist collectivist uh, planned economy in 
believe it or not, the new world order. I have to remember uh, the um, quote from Strobe Talbot mm -hmm. in 1992. He certainly knew this had been going on for a long time, and so did Bill Clinton. So anyway, you have the gradualism. And there's a marvelous quote in there from a leading change agent in the Montgomery County School plan out of Maryland in 19, that plan was 19, what was that? That was uh, 48, I think. Yeah, uh, Paul Mort came down from New York City, change agent into Montgomery County, Maryland, and implemented the plan for the whole country. That's in here. And at the time, he said, it takes 50 years mm. to bring about change. Shall I just want to yeah. let you know you have five minutes okay, to get fine. this all in. Okay, <gasps> so it, it took 50 years. We're right there, right on target. So that was the gradualism. And the Paul Mort stuff is in there. And the Montgomery County plan, incredible. So uh, then came uh, the next prong in your fork. You're all going out gardening. So you've got, you must have a three prong fork, don't you? Yes, you know, I do. I think I see the mist. And so the next one is the dialectic. And I know that sounds like a big word and it's complicated, but it really isn't at all. And I, what you, you want something. Say you want to control the local schools in mm -hmm. Maine. And you don't know how to do that because everybody wants to hold on to their, you know, elected officials and all this and that and make their own decisions. Well, you just get the costs of education going so high that the property tax is out the window and everybody starts screaming. The old people have to move from their houses, et cetera. So what do they do? They did it in Michigan. They tried to do it in Maine and it didn't really work. We fought it. But in Michigan, they did it. They came to the people of the community and said, well, you know what? Don't worry anymore. You don't have to fund education at the local level. We'll take care of that at the state level. This will bring your property tax down. They fell for it. So they create a crisis yes. so they can come in and save the day. Yes. And people are desperate saying, oh, okay, yes. okay. That's right. Okay. okay. That, the, that funding of, of, of education is a very important one there. So that you could use it with anything, like the, the California crisis in electricity. But the Very funding of education is the control. Oh, yes. As long as we Absolutely. allow federal funding, That's right. we're being controlled. Yeah. And the minute you move your local funding to the state level, uh, you know, the state level takes its orders from the federal level, state departments of education get up to 80% of their operating budget from my old office in Washington. So that means Augusta, when we bring, when we get rid of the Department of Education, Augusta's going to crash because they won't have any money to operate. All right, that's, that's that the, now we go from the dialectic to semantic deception, which the use of terms like basic skills. Basic skills to the average parent means reading, writing, and arithmetic, et cetera. Uh, to them, basic skills is uh, understanding the need for world government. <laughs> it's getting along with any lifestyle, approving of it, being tolerant of anything. So they have different definitions. Oh, yes, different definitions. And they, this is really bad that they've used this. So for instance, two minutes. OK, two minutes. Values clarification was changed to critical thinking when we caught on. Also, decision making. I always say, what parent doesn't want their child to be able to make decisions? Right. That is a program I would say, hooray. No, you know what it is? Decision making is making a decision who is going to be allowed in the lifeboat and who is going to be thrown in the ice water. Oh. And that is what happened at Columbine. This philosophy has created children who do not understand. They're, they're like they're out on a ship without a rudder, they're without a compass, because they, these values uh, destroying programs, which are in that big red book. Values destroying, destroying programs. programs. Yes. I think people need to remember Brought that. Brought about Columbine. Mm -hmm. And the talking heads, you, you hear them Sunday morning say, well, what are we going to do about our children? And what happened with this, these Columbine and Paducah, Kentucky, why are they doing this? And I say, why not? Why not even more? The reason we don't have more is because there are still good teachers who are refusing to participate in this kind of education. And I, I plead with people not to fall for the school choice proposals. There is no school choice proposal that is legitimate or, or safe as far as I've seen, except for homeschooling, and be very careful, don't accept anything from the local school system. If you do, computers or money or anything, you will be controlled. And so the, the but, minute, but tuition tax credits or vouchers are very dangerous. France went down the tube with tuition tax credits. If you accept a penny from the federal government, you're going to have to conform your curriculum, your standards, your graduation requirements, et cetera, to the federal government, which is actually the international government. Charlotte, what's the name of your group in Maine? 
Oh, we no longer exist, actually, because the wonderful president of it has, is not well. But it was Guardians of Education for Maine. And we were in existence for 23 years. And we, we did quite a lot of good. And, uh, and I, but I think our time has sort of passed. Yeah. Is it on a website or is it the website's off? Too? I think it may have a website. Yes, Jim, Guardians of Education for Maine, uh, dot org or dot com. But people should get my website. That's what Absolutely. I need. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Charlotte, thank yep. you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. Now, you've got to get Charlotte's book, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. Remember, federal funding is going to destroy your child's life, basically. Exactly. Okay, call up Charlotte if you have any questions you want to. Um, Educate yourself about exactly what's happening. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.